Thank you, Bev. Uh, my name is Steve Scherer. I'm at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. <clears throat> Good evening. It's my great honour to introduce Senator James S. Cowan as the recipient of the 2016 Advocacy Award by the American Society of Human Genetics for his leading efforts to prevent genetic discrimination in Canada. He shares this award with the Canadian Coalition for Genetic Fairness. A native and resident of Halifax, Nova Scotia, Senator Cowan studied at Dalhousie University where he obtained his arts and law degrees. He then attended the London School of Economics, receiving a master's of law degree. And in 2009, Dalhousie University awarded him the degree of Doctor of Law. Senator Cowan has practiced law in Halifax since 1967. In 1983, he was appointed as Queen's Counsel. For many, many years, Senator Cowan was actively engaged in the life um, <clears throat> of Dalhousie University, and from 2000 to 2008, he served as the chair of the university's board of governors. Senator Cowan was also director, chair, and vice president of both Camp Hill and Abbey J. Lane Hospitals, and vice chair of the Metropolitan Health Planning Board. He was also director of the Nova Scotia Division of Canadian Cancer Society, and a founding director of the Landmark East School, a school for children with learning disabilities in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. The list goes on. Senator Cowan was appointed to the Senate of Canada <clears throat> on the recommendation of Paul, uh, Prime Minister Paul Martin Jr. on March 24, 2005, and sits in the Senate as a member of the Liberal Party of Canada. <clears throat> he was named opposition whip in the Senate in 2007 and was appointed leader of the opposition in the Senate in 2008. And in 2014, the Senate Liberal Caucus reaffirmed Senator Cowan's leadership through internal elections and a position he held up until June of this year. Senator Cowan's important work on Bill S-201 to prohibit and prevent genetic discrimination, importantly including both <clears throat> that of employers and insurance, uh, passed the Senate unanimous, unanimously as a, as a result of his work in 2016 in April. It is now <clears throat> before the House of Commons as we heard, and this is a critical time in Canadian history. In <clears throat> the previous par uh, Parliament, he also proposed legislation to address the criminal justice system's approach to persons suffering from mental illness. Senator Cowan was also a member of the Special Joint Committee on Physician-Assisted Dying. <clears throat> on the personal note, um, I've gotten to know Jim over the past few years and hold him in the highest regard. He is stately and wise, and he has taken time to learn and understand the intricacies of genetic science, the importance of genetics in society, and that genetics is the denominator to our common humanity. Most importantly, like any good scientist with their experiments, Jim is tenacious in his politics. And thankfully for all of us in this country, his tireless leadership and advocacy have brought us to the brink, and we're at the brink now, of a time when the most fundamental essence of Canadians, our DNA, might finally be protected. Please join me in showing our extreme gratitude for Senator Cowens for his very hard work for our society. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, Steve, for that, uh, for that generous introduction. It's, it's a great honor to be here and to, and especially to receive this uh, award uh, with Bev and the Canadian Coalition for Genetic Fairness. I want to thank the American Society of Human Genetics um, for recognizing our work and for their very strong support for what we've been trying to achieve. I know that I speak for Bev as well as myself in saying that we're deeply honored to have been singled out for this award. In fact, we're only part of a team of people who are fighting for a strong Canadian law against genetic discrimination. Bev has told you about the members of the Canadian Coalition for Genetic Fairness, including the hundreds and even thousands of volunteers who dedicate their time to the organizations represented by the Coalition. I also want to thank the extraordinary team of scientists and clinicians who've been working closely with us, advocating strongly every chance they get for Bill S-201. In particular, I want to single out Steve, Ronnie Cohen, Yvonne Bombard, Gail Graham, and Francis, Francois Bernier. And last, but certainly not least, I want to draw the attention 
to uh, Barbara Kajdan of my office, who was originally drew this problem to my attention and has been so key to the progress of this bill that we often refer to it in, the, in our office as Barber's Bill. Now, laws don't get passed by any one legislator. Bill S-201 finally passed the Senate this April after three long years. But in the end, as Steve mentioned, it passed unanimously. So I want to recognize my colleagues in the Senate who understood the critical importance of this bill for Canadians and joined with us to do their part in making it a reality. But as Bev and Steve said, we aren't there yet. The bill passed the Senate, but it's now in the House of Commons, and it's become very clear that it will not be clear sailing. We have a lot of work ahead, and I want to single out my friend and colleague, Rob Oliphant, who's the Member of Parliament for Don Valley West, who agreed to take this bill on in the House as soon as I mentioned it to him, and he's become a champion for genetic fairness on Parliament Hill. So I'd like to accept this award on behalf of our whole team and to thank them for all their work and effort and to warn them that we're not done yet. There's still a lot of work to do. The problem being addressed by Bill S-201 can be stated quite simply. Each of you here knows that the, revolu the revolution that is genetic science and how it's transforming the practice of medicine and the delivery of health care. You know firsthand the truly astonishing pace of scientific discoveries. Genetic medicine has the potential to truly and profoundly improve people's health and with it their lives and the lives of all those around them. But in Canada, our laws have not kept pace with the science. Other countries around the world have taken steps to protect their citizens from third parties who first insist on gaining unwanted access to a person's genetic test results and then use that information to the person's detriment. Canada has not. As a result, too many Canadians who have had genetic testing have found themselves the victims of genetic discrimination. And many more Canadians, and this is equally troubling, are reluctantly declining to have the testing that their doctors believe can help in their medical care. And they're taking that decision not because they don't want the genetic testing, but because they're afraid of genetic discrimination for themselves and their family. This is wrong. When the late U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy sponsored GINA, the American law against genetic discrimination, he hailed it as the first major new civil rights bill of the new century. He said the bill recognized that discrimination based on a person's genetic identity is just as unacceptable as discrimination on the base of race or religion. I agree. And the stories that people have shared with me bear this out. A young man, 24 years old, took the difficult decision to get tested for the Huntington's gene. He found out on a Friday that he was positive, that he had the gene. His employer had known of the young man's dilemma whether or not to get tested. They had what the young man considered to be a good and caring relationship. The employer asked about the result, and the young man answered honestly. As I said, that happened on a Friday. On the Monday, he was fired. He, didn't, he doesn't have Huntington's, and he is unlikely to develop the disease or to show any symptoms for decades. Indeed, Huntington's has been late onset in his family, not developing until well past normal retirement age. What's the difference between firing someone for something in their genes, something that is not developed and may never develop, and their race, which of course is also genetic? or their ethnic origin, or their religion. Ignorance plays a very large part in genetic discrimination. Again, no different from racial discrimination or religious discrimination. Let me share with you one more story. There's a young 
successful businesswoman in Ontario whose mother is living with ovarian cancer. Knowledgeable about this terrible disease, the silent killer of so many women, she went and got tested and learned that indeed she carries the BRCA genetic mutation. She underwent surgery, both a double mastectomy and had her ovaries removed. Now, as you know, as a result, she's lowered her risk of breast and ovarian cancer to at or below the level of a woman in the general population. But when she went to buy insurance, something she needs for her business, she could only get insurance at truly exorbitant rates. Now, she's no more of a risk to the insurance company than someone in the general population, and is certainly much less of a risk than she would have been without the genetic testing. But facts have never seemed to matter when it comes to discrimination, and that is holding true for genetic discrimination as well. Now, I understand that those in the insurance industry and employers and at others who engage in genetic discrimination would never see themselves as engaging in unacceptable discrimination. But speak to the individuals who are experiencing the discrimination, and one quickly sees that genetic discrimination is real. It's happening now in Canada, and the impact is profound. The young man I spoke of who was fired for his genes is afraid to go back in the workforce. That was his first job in the field. He's a video editor. Does he tell a prospective employer or friend that he was fired? If he tries to explain that he wasn't fired because of his work, he'd have to disclose his genetic test result, and that would risk more genetic discrimination. I'm told that he's terrified of people finding out of his genetic test results. Now, this is a young man just starting out in his life, but his life and his prospects are being hampered because of genetic discrimination. With more and more stories like this, little wonder that more and more Canadians are deciding not to have genetic testing at all. Now, you know much better than I the impact of this. It means that Canadians will watch the benefits of genetic medicine pass them by. A woman won't know that she carries the BRCA genetic mutation, so she won't be able to take the steps available now, today, from medical science to reduce the chance that she develops breast or ovarian cancer. A First Nations child from northern British Columbia, where we are now, won't know that he has the genetic mutation for long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome is usually considered to be a rare disease, but it's decidedly not rare among people of, of certain northern BC First Nations communities. Instead of the usual prevalence rate of one in 2,500 having this genetic mutation, Dr. Laura Arbour and her team have found an estimated frequency rate of one in 125. A person with the genetic mutation risks sudden death from a heart attack. But if you know you carry the mutation, there are steps you can take, beta blockers, for example, to essentially eliminate the risk. Fear of genetic discrimination is preventing doctors from being able to properly diagnose and then treat their patients. Dr. Ronnie Cohen, who's now chief of pediatrics at Toronto Sick Kids, has terrible stories of families desperate to find a diagnosis for their very sick children, but declining genetic testing for fear of genetic discrimination. He's told me that it's paralyzing for him as a clinician that he can't offer the best optimal care to the patients and families he sees in his clinic because of the lack of protection against genetic discrimination. And of course, they and other Canadians will not be able to benefit from precision medicine. They will not know if a particular drug will work well or not at all, or actually have negative impacts. While medicine is revolutionized the world over, we in Canada will be stuck in the past. 
So Canadians' health will suffer, and so will the work of our scientists and researchers, and indeed, our opportunities to develop an innovative biotech sector. As you know, Canadian scientists have been and continue to be at the forefront of genetic science. So many of our seminal discoveries, the genetic mutations associated with cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, and Huntington's, to name a few, were made in Canada. And our scientists, many of whom are here at this conference, are amongst the best in the world. We have invested in laboratories that are ready to sequence some 30,000 genomes a year. I've spoken with young scientists who are setting up orga organizations to seize the opportunities of precision medicine, looking to do large-scale genetic sequencing, in one case of 100,000 people in a single province. Such ventures are being ve developed literally across the country, from Newfoundland and Labrador on the East Coast to here in British Columbia on the West, and all points in between. But they know, as do our clinicians and our scientists, that they will not get anywhere, that Canadians simply will not be able to participate or benefit unless we have laws in place to protect their genetic information. That is why I introduced Bill S-201 back in 2013. In brief, it creates a new Genetic Non-Discrimination Act that would make it a criminal offense for a service provider or anyone to looking to provide a good or service or enter into a contract with a person to either require that person to take a genetic test or to disclose the results of a prior genetic test. It would also make it a criminal offense to collect, use, or disclose someone's genetic test results without that person's prior written consent. There are, of course, exceptions for healthcare practitioners and for research. As I said at the beginning, the bill is now in the House of Commons. We've been very pleased to receive broad expressions of support from members from all political parties and from across the country. But there is an obstacle, and it is a serious one. Not surprisingly, the insurance companies strongly oppose the bill. One of their arguments is that the bill is unconstitutional, that it's interfering in matters in provincial jurisdiction. Now, I won't go into the details, but I'm satisfied based upon opinions that we've received from the high, most highly respected constitutional experts in this country, that Bill S-201 would be upheld as constitutionally valid and a proper exercise of the federal legislative power. As a matter of fact, all the provinces and territories were consulted not just once, but twice, and not one raised any constitutional, jurisdictional, or any other policy concern about the bill. Nevertheless, this argument seems to be gaining traction with the federal government, which is speaking openly to stakeholders about significantly amending the bill to gut it of its significant and most critical provisions. After it's gutted, the government says that it would, would launch federal, provincial, territorial discussions to develop a so-called comprehensive pan-Canadian strategy about the use of genetic information. This is deeply disappointing. This bill has been before Parliament in one form or another for three and a half years. There's been ample opportunity for discussion, and the committee stage in the House of Commons will provide another opportunity to hear from Canadians about this issue. But instead of waiting to hear what Canadians have to say at those committee hearings, our government has clearly signaled that it intends to use its majority in the House of Commons to strip the bill of virtually all its meaning and relevance for Canadians. The fact of the matter is, and you've, you've heard from previous speakers, that other countries have had this kind of legislation in place for years, and in some cases for decades. We're already far behind, and it's disappointing for me, and it should be for all of us, that our government now plans to delay further while it launches another round of federal, provincial, territorial talks. And of course, 
While we wait, more and more Canadians are going without genetic testing that could help with their medical care. And Canadians who decide to get tested without waiting for legislation risk or actually suffer genetic discrimination. Now, it's my experience as a politician that one rarely finds unanimous support for any proposition, for any initiative. That's simply the reality in a large and diverse nation such as Canada. The challenge we face as legislators is to assess the competing interests from the perspective of the public interest and then to reach a conclusion. For me, when I balance the monetary interests of the insurance industry against the potential health benefits for countless Canadians, my choice is clear. Every time I speak about this issue across the country, whether to an audience or to the media, I hear another story of an individual or a family whose life has been impacted by genetic discrimination, or equally powerful, the fear of genetic discrimination. As I said earlier, this is a case where science is outpacing the law, and the consequences of that gap are being felt right across the land. As legislators, we have a responsibility to pass laws which will project, protect the legitimate privacy interests of individual citizens, while also enabling our medical doctors and world-class and innovative scientists to advance their important work which ultimately benefits us all as individuals, our families, our friends, and society as a whole. The time to act is now. As I said earlier, we've appreciated the support of ASHG in our efforts to date, but we're now asking at least the Canadians in ASHG to join with us to, to support the letter which will be circulated within the next little while to our government urging them to seize this opportunity and to pass this legislation. Before I close, I'd like to quote from the words of President Barack Obama. He was speaking about the genetics resolution, revolution and the precision medicine in the United States. Here's part of what he said when he launched the precision medicine initiative on January 30, 2015. And we're here to harness what is most special about America, and that is our spirit of innovation, our ability to dream and take risks and tinker and try new things. And as a result of that, it will not only improve our economy, but improve the lives of men and women and children for generations to come. And together, what's so exciting is that we have the possibility of leading an entirely to new era of medicine that makes sure new jobs and new industries and new life-saving treatments for diseases are created right here in the United States. As Canadians, we're eager to join in this new era, to challenge our American counterparts for the title of leader in this new medical world, to reap the benefits for science, for our economy, and most importantly, for individual Canadians and their families. But first, we need to fix our laws. We need to legislate to end genetic discrimination. So I'd like once again to thank the American Society of Human Genetics for this award, the international recognition of the work of our team advocating for Bill S-201 is much appreciated and underscores the critical importance of this bill for Canadians. The honor that you've bestowed upon us will undoubtedly help in our fight to continue to move the legislature for, forward. And for that, on behalf of our whole team, I thank you.